exactly when you are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so no, no. Well, we were doing all the focuses and uh, like. Um, uh, I'd like to, to know where the interest in the story for you started. Was it from the play, from the book, both co at the same time, uh, or, or the subject and then you? Well, I, I think I probably secretly, maybe unconsciously, if I can say, I've uh, been wanting to do something about Freud forever, you know, and, but just to say, uh, I'd like to do a movie about Sigmund Freud is not enough. That's not drama. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a structure, you know, to, in, in order to explore uh, what you're interested in. And when I read um, Christopher's play, I thought, here is a fantastic stru structure because I, I hadn't really known about the existence of Sabina Spielrein. And, uh, and so suddenly here was a story about Freud, Jung, and Sabina that was a kind of a, uh, an intellectual menage a trois mm. that was fantastic. And so that, that, mm. that for me, as soon as I read that, I thought this, this would make a great movie. Yeah, it seems it's, it's a menage a trois, but there is uh, like a, a third outsider that ha has a very important role in the story too. So can you tell me something about this figure that's a bit more obscure as Sabina is? You know, uh, everyone knows who Freud and Jung were, but not everyone knows. I mean, I didn't know who Otto Gross I was. Didn't a, yeah. actually. I, yeah, I, I so really learned about Otto Gross for the first time um, mm. when uh, David contacted me. I see him as a trap, really. A trap that eventually Freud is sending to Jung, you know, supposed to cure him, but finally he's going to learn a lot of, uh, out of mm. him. It's like uh, the horse of Troy. Yeah, Trojan horse. Uh, Trojan horse yeah. kind of a character. And. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know, it seems like he's a, he's a bit of an alien in the movie. You know, mm. he's, uh, the, the first pictures I've seen of him, he looks like, uh, I don't know, like the, the manager of the Rolling Stones or something, you know, and he's, he does, doesn't dress the same way, he doesn't act the same way, he's, he has such a very, uh, let's say, a very modern way of living in a way. Yes. Mm -hmm -hmm. And so um, I took the part as a present, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you tell me something about your character and also about the physical demands of the part, uh, especially in the first 20 minutes? It's very, uh, very physical and very yeah. high. So what kind of research did you do on, on that too? And on the, um, you know, on, on the historical figure? Um, I'd never heard of her before I got sent the script. Um, I knew a little bit about the play. Um, because I'd worked with Ray Fiennes and he'd been in it, so he'd actually spoken to me about it, but I'd never read it. So um, when the script got sent, I just thought, wow, this is an extraordinary story. Um, I, sort of, I, I read up a lot on Jung and, um, and actually found a, a woman in London who'd compiled a book called Sabina Spielrein, The Forgotten Pioneer of Psychoanalysis. So I went to meet her and talked to her and then, and then read that. But I sort of saw her as like, um, almost like two people trapped in one body. You know, one, one person was the sickness and and this kind of horrendous trauma, and the other was this incredible intellect. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a, a really interesting um, part of the process was kind of mapping out when the sickness takes over and when the intellect takes over. Mm -hmm. So that, that was all kind of amazing. As far as the physicality goes, everywhere it was all about that she was ravaged by ticks, but it never actually sort of described what the ticks were. Mm -hmm. So uh, David had said, well, I want to shoot close up, so put it on your face. Um, and I read in her diary excerpts that she saw as herself as dog-like and demonic. So mm -hmm. I sort of wanted to reflect that on the face, a kind of de demonic quality. So it came from that, really. Mm. Um, you, you said you, you uh, wanted to make a movie about Freud for a long time. And of course, it's interesting to see in your career, you started from very physical, uh, from horror and you know uh, visualization of what we have inside and turning more and more towards the shall i say cerebral or like uh, through to the mind's monster so uh was that uh, a conscious effort of yours to go towards something more uh deincarnated uh or uh, no or just i don't happened? think so i mean you you sort of well you can see by what kira did in the first scenes in the movie it's extremely physical i mean it, it's sure. as physical as anything i've ever done mm. except uh, it's cheaper with kira because i don't need to do special effects she just does it herself <laughs> so you get you you get two things for for the same price it's very good um no, I, it's, no it, it really is the project, you know. I mean, when you, when you decide uh, that you will give yourself to a particular project, you just do it. And I don't really think in terms of my career or development or anything like that. I mean, that's, that's an analysis that you don't, I don't really, mm. I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't give me anything creatively, you know. It, it, so I don't really think in those terms. If, if, I had, if, if I had, if this project had come to me 
15 years ago, I would have done it 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, we have just two minutes, so I'm asking to all of you, what was the hardest part for you, for you, and for you in the movie? Either a scene or, or uh, whatever. What was the most challenging moment in making this film? Definitely the English for me. <laughs> for me, it was his English. <laughs> No, but in fact, for me, it was the boats. I get seasick. I don't know what it is for me. I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. It, see, it, it was a beautiful shoot, you know. It was really uh, a, a wonderful experience, really, for everybody, including the crew. And so, in a way, it's just the normal challenges. There's no, no one specific thing that, that it, it's just uh, the way, the flow of it, you know. It was, okay. it was too nice a shoot to think about difficulties, actually. Yeah, well, was there a great deal of rehearsal before shooting or? Uh, no, I, I never rehearse. I never mm -hmm. want to rehearse. We, we, we would block the scene before, the d on the day that we're going to shoot. That's the first time that I actually hear the actors saying the dialogue. Uh -huh. And then we uh, figure out how to shoot it, and we just shoot it. I, I have found, in my experience, I know there are directors who love to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, mm -hmm. and maybe it works for them. I've never found that it works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, f because as soon as you have the actors in their costumes, on the set, everything changes. Mm -hmm. So I say, why bother then? Because it's, you know, so, uh, and then you get a certain spontaneity and fear, which is good. Yes. You're afraid, you're like, well, will this work? Uh, so I've never done rehearsals, and, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I've never found the need for them. Yeah, I'm asking the actors, does he do a lot of takes uh, or, or not? Because fear, you know, keeping you on the edge, some, some directors do that. And he some does don't. one or two. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure, yeah. really. You know, one or two takes. Uh, I find r if you have actors who really understand the role, you don't need more. You know, I, I, we all, all have heard about Kubrick doing 60 takes and 70 takes. To me, that is pathology. That's not filmmaking. Uh, uh, I don't think you get anything more from that. I think you, you get less, actually. So for me, one or two takes, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Never said that.